Have you been in an abusive relationship with a narcissist or an abuser? If you have, and you are looking to understand why me, if you are looking to understand how these things keep happening over and over, for me, I wanted to know, why do the people that I love hurt me so much? And that opened the can of worms to self-reflection and self-understanding. Codependency was a very big piece of that puzzle. I didn't like the title. I didn't like being labeled as a codependent. And it, it wasn't until I really understood it and I studied it that the shame about it kind of dis disappeared, if you would. Knowing that I'm a people pleaser seemed better than knowing I was a codependent. Codependents are in a spectrum. There's a whole range, just like there are is for narcissists. There's, there's a range of behaviors and things that we have been doing without knowing it. I'm going to read something from my guest's website before I introduce him. And he says, one of the biggest myths about a dysfunctional relationship is when the person is more concerned about the needs of others than his or her own self needs. It's often characterized by excessive caregiving, enabling, controlling, and an unhealthy need for recognition or approval. This is very often unconscious. So as I sat there and I read down the list of all the types of things, um, low self-esteem was one of them. And I kept saying, that's not me. Can't have that. I, I am very confident in myself. But the reality is, if you look real deep, the reality is that I wasn't confident in myself enough to care for myself and say, this is wrong and I deserve better. So I want you to welcome my guest, Brian Pissor. He is the founder of Codependency No More, and he's got a great website, podcast, and he is here to help us better understand codependency and to relieve some of the stress and inner feelings of shame that go along with identifying these behaviors in ourselves. It's okay, but we can't heal unless we understand why we have these behaviors. Once we understand why, we can go on and heal. And that's the idea here. So let's welcome Brian. Thank you so much for joining me. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you. And, and I found you through your um, podcast, Codependency No More. So how did you get started doing this? Well, that's a great question. Uh, I guess it was um, just a matter of circumstance. My sister was in an, an incredibly abusive relationship about a little over 10 years ago now with a, a narcissistically abusive man. Uh, he, she was put through the ringer in this relationship, emotionally, mentally, physically abused for close to five years altogether. And she ended up in a rehab facility for drugs after she broke away from the relationship. And Probably, as you and many of your audience know, it takes more than one try sometimes to get out of these relationships. And on average, it's about seven. Well, it took her 10 tries to actually leave and stay away for good before, you know, before she left. So she gets out of the relationship. Uh, my family's been there for her the whole time, and we're you know, trying to figure out what do we do next. Well, she ended up in a rehab facility for drugs. He was a drug dealer. She was taking you know, cocaine and who knows what else. And so she ended up in this rehab facility and they told her within two days, you don't have a problem with drugs whatsoever. Your, your addiction is behavioral and it's something called codependency. And that was the first time that any of us had ever heard this word codependency before. Mm -hmm. So uh, she went through a kind of a barrage of healing activities, uh, dialectical behavior therapy, CBT, of course, um, AA and Al-Anon groups. She was in a mental hospital for post-traumatic stress disorder. She went through the ringer. She read all kinds of books. And uh, through this process, my family learned a ton because you know, we went to Al-Anon meetings with her and we supported her the whole way. And sometime shortly after she 
really made the, the major trek through recovery, the, the major part of recovery where she's taken her life, which is in shambles and getting back on her feet. After she was really established again, we decided to, I, I actually wanted to build a website and I asked her if she would be interested to use her experience with codependency as the, uh, the, the main point of that website. So she agreed and we put her story out there uh, in a blog and we offered a, a short mini course of here's what she learned throughout the process that if you're struggling with the same thing, here's what, here's some things that helped us. And I had no idea what would happen. I didn't even know if one person would come and visit that website. Well, as it turns out, we now have uh, a, a list of tens of thousands of people on email. And we started a podcast several years ago that has uh, just about a half million downloads at this point. And we have um, 10 to 15,000 visitors to the website every single month. And I had no idea how common this problem is and how many people need help and, and really desperately need help in some cases. So just the fact that there's so much demand and the fact that I've always been interested in sort of interpersonal relationships and, and just communication and uh, neuroscience, it's, it's really a great combination for me to uh, kind of step up and, and learn more about this so I can try to help some other people too. That's a, that's a great story. I wish I had a brother like you. Um, the question is, I know she was in this abusive relationship and that's why you're here on my narcissistic abuse channel, but how do you become codependent? How, is this something that like, I mean, a narcissist that the history in the narcissist could be that their parents abuse them. Um, how does someone become a nurse? I mean, a <laughs> codependent. That's a great question. And, and, you know, really that's something I've struggled with. And I finally feel like I have a, a, a good answer that really addresses or can address almost any situation. The common wisdom for how do I become codependent is that it's, it's an issue of toxic shame. It's, it's an issue where um, you perhaps grew up in an addicted household or an invalidating household and you weren't really loved properly by your caregivers or maybe you were even abused by your caregivers. And, um, and as a result of not getting the, the love and attention that a child really needs in order to feel nurtured uh, emotionally as a child, they have this sense of shame. And, and it's not a, you know, we talk about guilt and shame and, you know, guilt is one thing and it has its place and guilt is actually a good thing. It, it tells you that you're violating some kind of internal standard. Whereas shame is, is much more destructive. Shame is really baggage. It's, it's saying there's actually something wrong with me as a person and it's, uh, it's detrimental. It can be detrimental to somebody's life until they learn how to, you know, put that shame down. And so the, the common wisdom has always kind of been, it's, it's a matter of toxic shame and it happens when there's an invalidating upbringing or some sort of abuse or trauma that happens in your life and it causes you to dissociate with self. And now you are, uh, your, your focus is now on other people instead of your own self. And, uh, but the ironic thing for, for, my, for our situation is that we grew up in a perfectly healthy household. Uh, my parents, are wonderful parents. They always have been and they still are. We were loved. And uh, I always wondered, how did this happen to my sister when, when we grew up this way? And, and to, to make matters worse, there, there are plenty of people who come to my platform and they do not identify with this issue of toxic shame. Now, many of your audience, I, I assume, would identify with, with what I've just described, but there are lots of people out there who have a story like mine. I, I grew up in a healthy household. How did this happen to me? And, and, the, real, and the answer to that is, that it can be is that trauma and, and abuse, uh, let's, let's, let's use trauma as our, as our example. Trauma doesn't have to be a one event uh, scenario. It doesn't have to be one traumatic thing that happened that just you know traumatized me and now I've dissociated and now I'm, I'm having codependent tendencies. It can be cumulative. So for example, if you have a parent who was a, you know, otherwise, a, a good parent but they were heavy on compliance. You must comply with everything that I want as a parent. And it doesn't manifest in abuse and it's not uh, uh, objectively abusive or traumatic for you, but you are just expected to comply 100% all the time. And it's a very strict household. Well, you, you now have the sort of the compass inside of you that my job is to please mom or please dad. And, and so what I'm, my motivation, what I'm always looking for is how do I please that other person? And so now I feel like I have these people pleasing characteristics because that, that tendency doesn't just exist in my, my, uh, my attachment relationship with my parents. It exists in my romantic relationships or even my friendships now. 
So it doesn't have to be this big traumatic thing. It can really be um, really any catalyst that can have a cumulative effect over time in small doses that can lead people to want to caretake, want to people please, want to seek approval from other people, or even be, be a, per, a perfectionist and always want these really high standards. And, you know, you have to meet my, my high bar and I have, you know, high standards for myself, but also for you, because that's just that's sort of the, the schema that I have uh, as a result of my upbringing. Wow. That's a great explanation. Thank you. What comes up for me when you talk about this and you start to identify some of the um, traits and, and things like that, when I first learned about this and, and I was trying to see if I fit into this mold, I didn't really get if I did, uh, some of the things were I was like, no, I don't have low self-esteem. You've got the wrong girl. You know, I'm perfectly, um, you know, I, I run a business. I, I have great love for myself. I'm like, I, I don't have that. But as I picked apart the bones of the chicken, so to speak, I was like, well, maybe I am a little bit like that. It, it, it was a very slow way to accept it because I didn't like the label. I didn't like being stamped with, oh, you were a narcissist, you're codependent, done. You know, I, I, I didn't want to believe it for myself and I didn't want to, to take on those things. But in time, I've learned and seen examples of how I was low self-esteem, meaning I didn't have enough respect for myself to say no to somebody. I, I, that's the kind of low self-esteem that we're talking here, not necessarily the, the whole package of low self-esteem, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I, I have... I've got a similar example for myself and it shows up in different ways for a lot of people. But yeah, to your point, we're not, if we're not walking around depressed on the verge of suicide, that doesn't mean we can't have um, a, a self image issue or something that causes us to, to seek validation. In my particular example, I didn't even realize that I had codependent tendencies until a couple of years after I started studying this. And the way that I realized it is because I identify very strongly with something we're going to talk about uh, the, for the codependency schemas, um, I identify very strongly with two of them actually, one of them being the approval seeker schema. So in relationships, I've never been the type to, you know, pander to my, to my significant other or really desperately want, to their, want their validation or cling to them or some of the things that we, that we think about when we think of codependency. But mine showed up as a tendency to work very hard at a job to be a workaholic in order to gain approval and seek validation from a boss and a, my management. I was, I was working 12 hours a day in some cases uh, in my younger adult years in a corporate job. Uh, really, money was really secondary for me. It was really just seeking this I'm good enough uh, feeling that, that I wanted kind of desperately. And, and so it, but it didn't occur to me until uh, a little while that that was happening for me. So I think it shows up in all kinds of ways. It doesn't mean that you have to have a, a depressive, a depressive disorder diagnosis or, or something like that. It can be you know, very, very normal looking people can have these tendencies and it's really a spectrum too. Yeah. I think that's exactly what I wanted people to understand here because um, this isn't a label. This is something that, that, that has specific characteristics, traits, um, and it doesn't mean you're a bad person. Because if we are going to take a label like this, you know, the, the people pleaser in me is like, I don't want to be a codependent. <laughs> but <laughs> it's, it's, it's something we have to face because if we don't face it, we can't make it better. Mm -hmm. To your point too, I, this, this might be that useful to, the, to your audience. Just very briefly, I'll make this point. I don't particularly like the label of codependent. I, don't, I think a lot of us don't. Um, I think what that word does for us is it gives us a, at least some kind of a label to put on this, this, this sort of cross section of behaviors that really they don't even have a, a, a diagnosis. This is not a, um, a diagnosis that's in the DSM in, in the mental health field. This isn't something you can say, you have this and, and there's a prescription you can write for it. It is sort of a cluster of behaviors and tendencies that people identify with. And when they can 
admit to themselves and acknowledge, yes, I have these kind of tendencies or some of these kind of tendencies, at least it gives us a chance to say, I feel heard and I feel understood. And maybe I even feel a little bit exposed because somebody was able to label my behavior so easily that there's, there's actually a label to put on it. So, but, but it also at the same time allows you to feel that I'm not the only person who has this and there must be things I can do from here on out to heal from it. So that's the beauty of the word codependency. Although, yeah, like I said, really don't care for it as much. And the other thing is it's, it's really a spectrum. Uh, there can be really healthy interdependence on one side and then beneficial interdependence, um, problematic interdependence, and then codependence, which would really cross more of a clinical threshold to where you might really need help from a counselor or some sort of professional at that point. So, so yeah, uh, it, just because you identify with the word codependency, you don't have to put a sign over your head that says, yes, I'm codependent. <laughs> just take note of that and realize and acknowledge these are my tendencies. There's something I can do about it. Let's get better from here. Yeah. I, I love that. Thank you. Now, um, you were talking about schemas before. Can we talk about those? Are they the, the signs of codependency? What is a codependency schema? Good question. Well, so first let me give credit where credit's due on this. This is, I, I've been looking at codependency from all, all sorts of different angles for the last several years. And uh, I intend to continue doing this and, and learn more and more and more. I feel like I've gotten to a place of a pretty decent proficiency to, to talk about it. So I'm, I'm happy to be on your program talking about it. But the codependency schema idea came from a woman called Christine Askew. And I, I'm not saying she developed it, but she's who kind of turned me on to this, this whole concept and introduced me to it. And when she did, she, she mentioned that it's not very uh, well known or talked about in the U.S. So I thought it would be you know, great to, to help bring this over here a little bit more. So Christine Askew from recoveryfromaddictiononline.com and schematherapyonline.com if you want to check out her work and, you know, learn more. But essentially, when we talk about codependency schemas, uh, the way that I like to think about them is, yes, they are, they're almost a way that you can identify your own brand of codependency, uh, which will help you feel yet even more understood and even more cl sort of classified into this sounds like me and, and it kind of shortcuts your ability to figure out what to do from here to get better. So with that, I will share the four codependency schemas and with each one of them, I'm going to talk about a set of thoughts, feelings, behaviors, and very importantly, triggers that tend to happen with that schema. And, and as I do this, the reason why I want, why I emphasize triggers so much is because triggers are a great way to start to heal and to start to shortcut the behaviors and the tendencies that you have when you start to recognize these triggers. So mm -hmm. I'm going to kind of shortcut you to here's what your triggers probably are if you identify with this schema. All right. So, so here we go. Yay. So the first codependency schema is called self-sacrifice. And this is the, really it's the rock. It's the fixer picture, a superhero with a cape flapping behind them in the wind. This person is just they're ready to take on the world. They're very proactive. They're strong. Uh, they typically believe that they don't have any problems themselves. They're very good listeners. The thoughts that accompany the self-sacrifice, and by the way, the self-sacrifice is, is the quintessential codependent. This is what the word codependency was coined for back in, in the uh, earlier uh, last century or mid last century when the word came into being. This was meant to define the person who fixes their alcoholic or their drug addicted spouse. They're always fixing and rescuing. So the thoughts that these people have are things like, well, if I don't do this thing for this person, who's going to do it? Their need is greater than, than my needs. I can cope. They're the one that needs the help. It would be selfish if I don't jump in and help this person. So there's a lot of selflessness with this particular schema. The feelings that accompany this schema are just general inadequacy, insignificance. They want to feel significant by helping other people. They feel empty inside. They feel guilty when they're not helping other people and selfish, and they can even feel resentful. The behaviors that accompany this particular schema are, they find it very, very hard to say no. If they're, they're a yes man or a yes woman. Mm -hmm. They give unsolicited advice like crazy. And I have a, a family member who does this masterfully. <laughs> uh, they tend to rescue people. They tend to caretake to the extreme. They'll cancel their own plans at the drop of a hat to help somebody else if they see an opportunity to do so. And the triggers, finally, the triggers that they have are if they see somebody in distress, if they see somebody who's been procrastinating and they feel that they need help in order to meet their deadline, they'll jump in to help them. 
if somebody asks them uh, for help with some kind of a favor, or if they just observe somebody that seems to be helpless, they'll drop everything to help that person. So that's the self-sacrifice schema. And I can keep moving through them to the next one if you want, or I'm happy to pause there, whatever you want. No, let's keep moving through them because I already identified with that. So you got one point for me. <laughs> okay, great. Great, great. So the second schema, and by the way, uh, being that your audience is, I'm trying to keep in mind, you know, who, who we're talking to here. Your audience is, uh, what they have in common is um, narcissistic abuse, from what I understand. A lot of them are recovering from this. Mm -hmm. So... I think it would be important to say that that particular schema is uh, pretty pretty aligned with um, a narcissistically abused person. They'll they'll have a tendency to identify with self sacrifice. But specifically, I would I would assume the number one schema that they will identify with is the next one, and it's called subjugation. So subjugators don't express thoughts or feelings very easily. Uh, picture somebody bowing down to a king uh, on their hands and knees, bowing down they put themselves second on the totem pole habitually. They're always below the person that they're talking to. They're always a notch lower than everybody else. They, they have a lot of fear. They fear retaliation from other people. They fear judgment from other people. So they're motivated to, to please other people to the extreme. So they come across as people pleasers. They come across as very anxious. They're anxiously trying to hold everything together and keep other people happy. The thoughts that come along with this schema are things like, you know, if I don't do this, then that person might judge me. They might reject me or they might even hurt me. They might mentally, emotionally, or even physically hurt me. So I need to keep them happy. So therefore, I, I won't do anything that's going to upset somebody else. The feelings that accompany this particular schema are feeling hurt, feeling feelings of abuse, feelings of rejection, rejection driven by shame and in, 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 inadequacy, excuse me. And then sometimes even depression comes with this particular schema. The behaviors that come along with self-sacrifice, I'm sorry, with subjugators are uh, people pleasing as well. But the motivation, unlike self-sacrificers, the motivation for subjugators is, is less about rescuing and it's more about personal safety. And then the triggers that come with this schema are confrontation, uh, anger from other people, being asked to do something. These are all things that, that typically are the catalyst for this person jumping into action. Mm. That makes sense. I, I was just like recalling an episode of a Grace and Frankie last night. <laughs> I have a friend here from Australia and I was making her watch it. And um, the, the character played by Jane Fonder was dating for the first time. And she was pretending to like everything that this man liked. And she's out there golfing. And, 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 and the other one, Frankie's like, you hate golfing. What are you doing? And she said, I'm afraid he won't like me if I don't do what he does. And that's very, you know, that whole fear of I don't want to rock the boat. I don't want to be me because I don't think I'm good enough. And, and like just watching that, I was like, I totally see what was going on there. So sorry, you know, we're up to number three. <laughs> that, that's fine. That's quite all right. And yeah, to your point, uh, these are these are all driven by fear. Particularly, the subjugator is driven by an intense fear of retaliation, judgment, and just being in danger. So uh, yeah, in fact, what you described will uh, will apply to the next schema as well. The the the, the tendency to agree with everybody and not. Uh, cause waves. Mm -hmm. That's very much the approval seeking schema, which is the next one. So the approval seeker, their primary motivation is to be liked, to be applauded and to be recognized or congratulated. The thoughts that these people have are, was I good enough? Did I do well enough? Do you like me? Am I funny enough? Am I fast enough or pretty enough? Or will, will that person approve of me? Mm -hmm. So that leads to a lot of, you know, agreeing with other people, not making waves, uh, they, they find it really, really hard to break popular opinion. That's one of the behaviors they have is go along with popular opinion no matter what. Look to the outside to see who's watching, and the motivation is to agree with them in order to be accepted into the group or the person and then boost my self-esteem as a result because the feelings are insignificance, uh, shame, anxiety, and those are some of the common with the last ones we mentioned, but uh, insignificance is, is very common in all of these. And then passiveness rather than directness. Mm -hmm. uh, these are some of the feelings that these folks have. Triggers are making decisions, being put on the spot, being asked about your opinion about something, 
that's, uh, that's a, a big trigger for an approval seeker. Even just figuring out where do you want to go for lunch today can be difficult for the approval seeker to give an answer um, because they want to they want to ask everybody else first to make sure everybody agrees. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Yeah, I know a lot of people like that. Yep. Yeah, I think we probably all do. <laughs> yep, and 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 that's actually one of the ones I I identified with when I first uh, realized that uh, about these schemas when I first learned about them and realized that the last two are actually something that have been an issue for me. So uh, when you combine them together, it makes perfect sense for me as kind of the workaholic that I've been in my life. The, the last schema is called unrelenting standards. And these are your quintessential perfectionists. These people judge themselves against high standards, high internal standards, but they also judge other people in terms of, in accordance with their high standards that they set on others. So they can be very critical. They come across as controlling or stressed out a lot. And this can be directed at themselves or, again, at other people. The thoughts that, that the unrelenting standard schema has are often, I'm not, I'm not uh, fit enough. I'm not pretty enough or thin enough. I'm not fast enough. I'm not competent enough. I'm not good enough. They, I should be better or this should be different than it is. They have a big case of the shoulds, if you've ever heard that before. <laughs> there's a lot of, I should be this way. You should be that way. There's, there's a sort of almost impossible standard that they set for the world around them. Mm-hmm. And the, the feelings that accompany that are failure, inadequacy, fear, fear of criticism, um, dissatisfaction. I, I did something that I, I'm not satisfied with. I'm going to do it again until it's perfect. I've, I've totally been like that in my life. Um, agitation and pressure are some of the feelings they have. Uh, behaviors that they have are very obviously being a workaholic, uh, being controlling, being very critical, of course, internally self-critical, but also judgmental and critical of other people are some common mm-hmm. behaviors. And then the triggers associated with, with this are uh, being at work, uh, working on a project, hearing criticism from another person, uh, being compared to another person, and which raises that whole self-critical uh, attribute uh, a, a whole lot. And then preparing for an occasion, you know, you might be preparing for your, your child's wedding and everything has to be perfect. So these are some of the things that, that really get the unrelenting standard schema going. Um, so, so in a nutshell, those are, those are the kind of the definitions of the four schemas. And uh, I'm happy to you know, talk at length or, or you know, talk more about each one of those or address any specific questions you have or how these might apply, you know, to people or what they can do with these now that they've heard about them. So uh, when you were just saying that last one, oh my gosh, I had a friend that like, I could uh, just sit there and I was like, yep, 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 yep. Um, I go and I stay with her every year and um, it's, everything has to be perfect. It's no matter what happens, it has to be the perfect wine. It has to be the perfect meal. You didn't stir it three times to the left and three times to the right. Oh my God, people are going to (laughs) know. And I, I sit there and at first, and before I learned about codependency, I would say she was a perfectionist. I would say we grew up in Westport, Connecticut with Martha Stewart and it's like in our genes. But now I see it as not making those excuses and, and saying, okay, she's a perfectionist. No, there's something much, much deeper where it's actually harmful to her and the people around her that she puts these standards on, on herself, on her guests, on her family, and she drives people away because if it's not perfect, it's not good enough. And that makes everyone around her feel inadequate. And she feels more like a queen because she's running this show. But if anything goes wrong, it's this self-hatred and anger inside that I now see is so completely different than the where are the Martha Stewart crowd? Is that what we're talking about here? Yeah, I mean, it's a great point. I, I think it's a great, a great segue for me to say that while a lot of people that are watching might identify with one or more of these schemas very mm-hmm. closely, uh, somebody might be listening and saying, yeah, well, I mean, of course, you know, people can identify with these. We, we all have different characteristics that might align with some of these. So what's the big deal, right? And uh, what you mentioned is, is a great segue to say, yes, we can, just because you agree, you see yourself in one of these schemas or more, that doesn't mean that you're, you have a major problem with codependency. 
um, or that everybody's codependent. Again, it's really a spectrum. It's really, there's little tiny degrees of it, and then there's really major degrees of it. And when you really notice that it's a problem in your life to the extent that you mentioned, for example, with your friend, if you notice it getting in the way of living a normal, happy, fulfilling life, that's when you need to start taking note of it. Yeah, I like it when things are neat and clean. I have a standard for my home. I like it when things are put away and dusted. Um, it makes me feel better. Uh, am I OCD? No. Am I, does that make me somehow codependent or perfectionist? Not necessarily. But mm -hmm. if, if that compulsion, if that need to do that is, interfere, is, is actually driving friends away from me because they feel controlled and manipulated by my need to, be, uh, to have everything perfect, that's a problem. And it's on the person to re who, who has that issue to recognize that that's a problem and then to do something about it. If you're, if you're people pleasing to such an extent that you literally get stressed out and, can't, and, and your mind gets so fuzzy that you can't make a decision because you're, you feel like you're put on the spot and you can't stand up for yourself and say, yes, my favorite color is blue because you're afraid that other people are going to judge you for that. That's a problem. So um, it's really about, it's, it's really a, uh, it's, it's about understanding uh, really being honest with yourself and understanding how bad of an issue really is this for me. Is it getting in the way of me living a fulfilling uh, life? And, and that's, that's what we have to, so, so we can use these schemas to, to, to realize, yeah, that sounds like me or that gives me motivation because you put a, you put a name to it and yes, those are my triggers. And yes, this is bad enough that I want to get a start on it. Then I've, I've basically helped you shortcut uh, some things that you can start working on and triggers that you can start addressing right up front. That's kind of the purpose of, uh, of, of laying out those schemas that way. Yeah. I, I have a quote from your website. Simply put, codependents give too much and typically to their own detriment. Yeah. So, I mean, that's kind of like the bottom line is you can give. It's okay that you're a giver. But if you're not taking care of yourself, then you become vulnerable to a taker because if we're the givers and a narcissist is the taker what's a better match than that i mean we are like completely enmeshed in each other's codependent you know i want to make him better i can heal him i can love him better than before she did this he did that you can go back and forth does codependency affect men and women the same or is there a higher percentage of women or how does it come out in that kind of relational yeah, good, thing? Good question. Uh, so uh, does it doesn't affect them the same. So I'll answer that two different ways. Uh, yes, it affects them the same in terms of we're all human and we all can, uh, can have the, we, our neuroscience. I mean, what, while males are different than females, yes. The neuroscience is similar in, in men and women. We're, we're talking about some people use love and some people even use uh, things like sex and other behaviors as an addiction. Codependency is often seen as an addiction. And I think that's a, a good, I, I, I respect that view of it. I think there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of similarities between codependency and substance addiction. And if you look at the neuroscience in the brain, there's, there's these... Uh, reward systems that that fire and trigger when somebody avoids the catastrophe that they're motivated to avoid because of their codependent tendencies or gets the love for example in, in a narcissistic abuse situation this might identify your audience might identify with this one uh and it also addresses the very first question you asked me how do you become codependent uh you, you take a person who otherwise seemed like they had a healthy upbringing and all of a sudden they get ensnared in this trap with this narcissistically abusive individual. And we know what they do. They charm you. They suck you in. They make you feel like you're, you're getting, uh, you're, you're loved and, and, and they're all you need and, and they can fulfill you completely by themselves. And then they sort of isolate you from your friends and family and the outside world. And then they start to subtly manipulate you. And then that just kind of keeps heaping on and leads to physical abuse. <clears throat> but they know that when you've had enough, they can turn on that charm again and they can, bring you back. And when that happens, the reward, the, the, uh, the, the peptides in your brain, the reward, the rewards happen. It's almost like you're getting, it, it literally is like you're getting a shot of do, uh, dopamine and oxytocin and, and those loving feelings coming back. And they know how to play you like a piano in that way to keep you coming back whenever you, you feel like you've had enough. And you're so sort of addicted to that rush of brain chemicals. Similarly, when you do cocaine, you know, similar drugs, uh, similar, similar chemicals are dumped into the brain when you do these things, these substances, and, and, and they happen when, you, uh, when you're in a codependent relationship. 
and getting that love that you crave so much, you're getting a similar dosage. So, so it's a great analogy. And the reason I say all that is because that goes for men and for women. Um, men, men get this, you know, the, the similar feelings and similar chemicals dumped into their brain whenever, whenever they experience, you know, love and connection with another individual. So, so that part is true. Yes. Now, if you want to look at percentages to, to answer it the other way, I've, I've done some pretty extensive surveying of my audience and, um, I have Facebook analytics and some great tools that help me understand. I even had my, my podcast listeners, uh, do a quick demographic survey because we're looking for sponsorship at this point. And I got a nice pretty graph that came back and basically told me about 85 to 90% in all the three studies I've done, 85 to 90% of the people who listen to my podcast and visit my website are female. Um, does that mean that females have codependency more than males? Um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I feel like it's inconclusive to interpret that. My gut says, yeah. Um, you know, you look at all the, the, a lot of the books out there and a lot of the, the different places you can go to learn about it is very much slanted towards females. Mm -hmm. um, what I do know is that females do tend to reach out for help with codependency more so than males by, by a factor of about four to one. Wow. That's very interesting. But I know that in the, the um, narcissistically abused world, again, the numbers are like 80% women and 20% men. That doesn't mean that there aren't more men being abused they're just not seeking the help. And I think that comes from a stereotype and um, almost a, like an a architect type where men have to be brave. They have to be strong. They, they don't look for help. You know, it's, it's a stereotype that, that has just been in, ingrained in men to not seek help or you're not strong enough. And I think the world is tipping. I think we're getting more people to come forward. And I think that in time, more men will seek this help because they get into the same tailspin as a woman. And the ones that do seek help and that, that do go and try to figure out what happened, eventually, after you learn about the narcissists, you start to go inward and learn about yourself. And um, the truly whole people that want to get that whole piece of pie back are going to go and do this work. And when I first started all this self-discovery, people are like, well, you've got to do the work. And I was like, what work are you talking about? I'll do it. I'll do it. Just tell me what it is. But it's really about looking deep inside of you, looking at these patterns, like you mentioned, looking at the, um, the things that it has done in your life. If people pleasing is a bad thing, it's only a bad thing if you lose yourself. And so, you know, to me, I always thought if I pleased all the people, everything would be okay because I'm giving and giving and giving. But what I didn't realize it was taking away from me and I wasn't allowed my opinion. And I slowly got squished and squished and squished until I had no boundaries, until I lost myself. And I think that's what people have to realize, men or women, that it's just about reaching out for help and trying to find some answers and there's no shame in it because that's, as you said, in almost all of the four schemas, there's shame involved. There's shame in accepting that you're letting people walk all over you with the, the, the thought that you're just doing good. So that's like my friend, if, if you're doing good is hurting others, it's a bad thing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, can we talk about boundaries for a second? Because you also have another website, don't you? I do. Yeah. So, so how do boundaries work with the codependency or lack of boundaries? You know, boundaries is a very hot topic for people who identify as codependents. Uh, it's, it's really, in my research, it's the, the number one hot topic or keyword that people say, I need boundaries. I want boundaries. And so boundaries are, um, they're, if you, if you look at Dr. Henry Cloud's work, fantastic work, his book called Boundaries, uh, it really lays all this out very, very well. Um, there are two, two types of boundaries. There's internal limits and there's external limits. And I think people really only realize or think about the external limits when they think about boundaries. They think someone's cramping my style. How do I stop them from doing that and set up a boundary? Mm -hmm. But there, there are also internal limits and these particularly apply to the uh, to the uh, the first one we mentioned, the approval seekers, who who want to constantly jump in and fix and rescue. 
they, they lack internal limits more than the external limits. They need to, to have that internal limit where to recognize, oh my gosh, I don't need to do this for this person. This person's capable. Um, I, I have my own life to live. I don't need to be helping them all the time. I'm going to set a limit right here that says, when you feel this urge to do this, we're going to assess the situation. Is this a matter of life and death? Is this, a, is this something I really need to do? If not, then I am going to kindly forget about it and move on with my life. That's an internal limit. So, um, so yeah, there are two different types of boundaries and boundaries. What's what I think is important about boundaries is that, uh, a lot of people immediately think, yes, I need to set boundaries. And that while that might be extremely true for a lot of people, uh, it can be very difficult to achieve that until you start to build up, um, sort of a, a sense of self, sort of a sense of fortitude and self-love and self-care first, because if you don't do that and build a foundation under yourself, mm -hmm. you will buckle because there will be resistance when you try to set a boundary, especially a boundary with a person that's used to you having no boundaries. And now all of a sudden you're going to try to sort of put this boundary on them. No, they're going to push back. And they're typically the type of person, especially if you're with a narcissist who's great at pushing back and has no fear of pushing back and habitually pushes back. And you will buckle and cave if you don't have a sense of fortitude and a strong foundation under you. So yeah, we can talk about, you know, how to set a boundary. Um, I'm happy to, you know, go whichever direction you want to, but start with yourself first before you try to do it is, is an important thing to know right up front. That's really good information because as you said, um, we, we very often are so people pleasing that we're just giving, 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 giving. And I didn't know how to say no. And I know a lot of people don't, and they, they don't see that as a problem. They see that as I'm doing good. It's not that um, you're not taking care of yourself and you're, you're just always helping others. And so there, there comes a point where you're not honoring yourself. And that's, to me, I think a key part of this is to look at your own behaviors. And that leads me into, all right, you have done an amazing job of identifying what a codependent is, what the different schemas are. What can someone do? Can they heal? Can they get better? Because we know narcissists can't get better. So can a codependent change this pendulum and change their life? And what advice can you give someone to get started with that? Absolutely. Uh, the, the answer is a big fat yes, underlined and bolded. Uh, you, can, you, can do, you can do things to get better from this. Um, I've watched my sister do it. I've watched her take a, a journey, an amazing journey from uh, down in the dumps despair to um, taking wonderful care of herself as a person, is strong, is assertive, has two wonderful children, uh, is a wonderful mother. Uh, she's married and she's turned her life around. So you can, you can absolutely do it. I've seen it firsthand. I've also been able to overcome some of the challenges I've had with the things I've mentioned earlier. And uh, there are countless people who have had success. I've as I mentioned, I've been looking at this from all different angles for, for several years and I'm continuing to do that. And, and as, I've, as I've really reached out to people, the main way that I do this is by interviewing other people who are authors and experts and therapists and counselors and uh, have really anything to say about the issue. And as I go and collect all this knowledge, and of course I read books as well, um, as, I can, as I collect all this knowledge, I've, I've sort of siphoned it down and distilled it into five buckets, uh, what, what I call five necessities for codependency healing. And arguably four of these are absolutely necessary. And one of them isn't totally necessary, but I would argue that it's very, very helpful to do. So I'll tell you what they are. These are the, these are the things that you can do to help yourself to get better um, if you feel like you're having codependency issues. The first thing, by the way, and this isn't actually one of the five things, but this is, this is more of just a, a, a mandatory thing. Uh, I don't want to call it a no-brainer because it's not a no-brainer. I don't want anyone to take offense to, to, to think that this is a no-brainer, but because it's not intuitive for people who are tr in the trap. You must leave a toxic relationship if you're going to heal from codependency. And, and when I say toxic, uh, let's objectively define what that is. Are you, getting, are you being beaten? Are you being physically abused? Get out of that relationship. Uh, there's no reason, there's no excuse for why you should stay in that relationship. There's no excuse for why somebody should be able to do that to you. Uh, week in, week out, day in, day out. You must, you must remove yourself from a toxic relationship if you stand a chance at healing for the long term. 
Um, you will meet too much resistance if you try to stay in an abusive, toxic relationship. Um, now, there's different degrees of toxic. So I, I'll, I'll just set the bar at are you being physically abused or um, extreme or, or undergoing extreme mental and emotional abuse from a person who's more of a covert narcissist. That's a judgment call you need to make for yourself. But I just, I'm just here to tell you that it's very difficult to do much of anything if you're stuck in a relationship like that. Okay, so moving on to the five necessities. Assuming that you have, um, that you are removed from a toxic relationship, here's the five things that, that I think you need to do. Uh, reframe and reprogram. Uh, let me actually define these a little bit better for you. So reframing and reprogramming, basically identifying your schema and your triggers and starting to work, work around those and reframing and reprogramming your responses to those triggers. Uh, to do a self and a family evaluation, do a family of origin evaluation to understand where and how codependency came to be for you. It often started in your childhood, and there's a sort of cynical joking that goes on about the therapist community. Well, let's sit and talk about our feelings in our childhood, right? And, and, and people kind of cynically joke about that. What does that actually accomplish? The truth is, your first attachment relationship, which was with your parents or caregivers, mm -hmm. habits are formed. Your 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 brain uh, your brain um, your the the neurons in your brain are laid out and sort of wired together. And what wires together fires together, as Rick Hansen always says. So uh, so you need to 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 realize that you were there was sort of a set point that happened in your first attachment relationship with your parents. Those patterns are often carried forward into adult love relationships. So going back and evaluating the family of origin. And, and understanding how these tendencies might have come up based on your past can, can be extremely helpful and also extremely motivating to help you move forward. Now, that said, this is the one, one of the five that I think isn't totally necessary. This is a little bit backwards looking where we're talking about moving forward. So it's not totally necessary to do that, but I think it's very helpful. The third one is healing emotional wounds and really finding that, that, uh, that feeling of self-love that you need to start cultivating for yourself. So healing emotional wounds. Uh, the fourth one is setting limits on others and yourself, essentially setting boundaries. And the fifth one, the fifth one is supportive human connection. You need a community of people. You need um, maybe a sponsor, maybe a, maybe a therapist or counselor, maybe a group of friends, perhaps all of the above. Um, you need to not be around toxic people. You need to be around healthy people that you can confide in, that can understand what you're going through and help you towards your healing journey. So reframing and reprogramming, self and family evaluation, healing emotional wounds, setting limits on others and yourself, and support of human connection. Those are the five things that, in my opinion, absolutely must be done in order for you to heal from codependency. And the ones where I would start right away are your self and family evaluation and reframing and reprogramming and, and potentially healing emotional wounds. I think that all three of those can actually be done in conjunction with each other uh, right off the bat. Um, and so there are some, you know, some things I recommend that you can get started with if, if we want to talk about those too, but those are the five areas I would focus on. Those are great. And I really appreciate that you have done all of that work and you're willing to share this. That's the, 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 the most generous part about this community is once we learn it, we just want to get out there and tell the world and, um, I, I appreciate what you've been doing so much. I love your podcast. I've been listening to it since we first started talking a few weeks ago. And the experts that you have are so cool. They're just to sit there and listen. It's, oh, I, I totally will put the URL down below if people want to follow you and listen to this information. Because the, the beauty of a podcast is you could be taking a walk and getting some education. You could be in the car waiting for your kids to get out of soccer and getting an education. Um, and I, I just love what you've been doing and I really want to, to tell everyone about you. So how can they reach you? And um, I know that I took a quiz on your site. So can we talk about that and tell people how they can learn about more about you and, and um, that sort of thing? Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, so my website is called codependencynomore.com. And that's where my homepage is. You can find a lot of the things on my website right from there or, or go into the menu and, and find what I'm all about. Um, the, the way that most people actually find me is through my podcast, but also my quiz. So if you search codependency quiz in Google, I used to show up number one. Uh, someone just snuck in there within the last month. And, and so I'm number two now. 
but you can take uh, the codependency quiz that I have. Make sure you take the one at codependencynomore.com. It's just a simple 10 questions. It's not a professional diagnosis. I just want to say that out loud. Uh, first disclaimer, um, but it will give you a decent idea of where you fall on the human interdependence spectrum, as we like to say. So you'll get a result that says, here's where you fall on the spectrum based on how you answer the questions. You'll get a little video response of what your, res what your, um, uh, uh, what your result actually means to you. And then we actually review the answers to all 10 questions uh, that you can, you can go and basically see what they mean and, and what they mean about you, depending on how you answer them. So, uh, so yeah, go to codependencynomore.com and find the quiz in the menu or just search codependency quiz and, and click on the second result at codependencynomore.com. I also, like you said, have the podcast, the Codependency No More co podcast by Brian Pizer. And uh, I also follow me on Facebook and Twitter. It's, co it's Codependency No More is the Facebook page. And, uh, you know, we're always trying to build an audience there as well. And we, we have a lot of shareable content there too. Awesome. I really appreciate that you have taken the time to meet with me and I know that lots of people will have questions so we will put all of your information down below in the comments and um, I look forward to talking with you again so thank you so much for joining me today. Tracy thank you so much for having me I'm happy to answer any questions anyone has I'll follow along in the thread and I'm just happy to be here so thank you. You're welcome thank you. Thank you so much for watching. If you like what you saw, please subscribe. And if you hit the little bell down below, you'll be notified when I have another one of these Meet the Expert series. If you're recovering and you are ready to move forward, but you just don't know where to start, maybe you're haunted by the nightmares of what's happening. Maybe you are reliving the things that, um, put you in this place to be watching my channel about narcissist abuse. If you don't feel like you're back to you, I've got a quiz on my site. NarcissistAbuseSupport.com slash quiz. Take my quiz and we'll see where you fall in the recovery spectrum and we'll give you expert advice on what you need to do to move to the next level of recovery. There's so much to do here. And my goal is to make you heal the way I did. And I want you to come and take the quiz and subscribe to my channel and leave a comment down below. I love answering comments. And I think the best part of these videos is that we all engage and we all can share and help each other. So thank you so much for watching. This is Tracy and that's all I've got.